You're listening to Errol Parker and Clancy Overall, editors of The Batuta Advocate on Desert Rock FM. Welcome back to The Batuta Advocate radio show recording live here in the Budgie Smuggler booth in downtown Batuta. And today's guest is zooming in all the way from Los Angeles, rather quiet part of the world right now. As always. I don't think there's too much going on over there. The American dream he's living, uh, I believe. Matthew Riley, thank you for joining us. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. One of Australia's favorite authors. Um, how long have you been over there for? I've been living here since the start of 2015, so it's getting on to nearly six years now. How are you finding it over there? Is it much easier to write than back home here in Australia? You know, it's it's about the same when it comes to the writing, but it's been enormous fun hanging out and meeting sort of movie directors and screenwriters of uh, you know, big action movies, you know? Meet, meeting guys like Stuart Beatty, yeah. who is possibly one of Australia's greatest movie exports, he wrote Pirates of the Caribbean, and you know, making friends in the movie world. It's been phenomenal. I think every single pe- person who's ever read one of your books from the very start until today always have that in mind. There's that, there's that kind of film. It's almost like it, you can translate it to film automatically reading your books. What was, was that ever on your mind when you first started writing or you were just writing books? I was born in 1974. I grew up watching 80s action movies. Yeah. And when I sat down to write the first book, actually the first two, Contest and Ice Station, I just thought, I want to read a book which has the action of a big 80s action movie. <laughs> you did that well. And, yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I wish I could say there was some higher purpose, but I, I was reading Tom Clancy or Michael Crichton. Yeah. And they'd have like one action scene. And I thought, but the movies I watch have tons of action scenes. So I just started that way with Contest and Ice Station, and I'm a one-trick pony, and I'm doing my trick over and over again. (laughs) Well, it's it's obviously well known within um, the Matthew Riley world that to write your first book, it was bumped back by a couple of publishers, so you decided to, Mm. to back yourself, and that was Ice Station. What made you think... You know, this was worth having a punt on because it's obviously worked out for you. You know, uh, being young and stupid is sometimes an asset. And I was so naive, I thought, what could possibly go wrong? So I self-published that first book. You know, I'd given that book, the first one, to some friends. And they read it. And I, I said, you know, what do you think? And one of them looked at me and said, this is really good. <laughs> this, this, this. And he said, this reads like a real book. And I think he was sort of shocked that someone he knew might be able to write something which could be of professional quality. So sort of comments like that made me just think, go for it. You know, what have I got to lose? I'll just have to pay the bank back the loan. So <laughs> I did. It was, turned out to be a good decision. So how many were in that original print run of, of our station? Uh, there were 1,000. There are 1,000 right. copies. Uh, they sell on eBay now for 1500 bucks. <laughs> I've only got, got them up on the shelf there. I've got about six copies left. So They were all in the back room of my parents' house at one point. Yeah, is the story, story true where you were self-publishing and you'd listed your, your parents' landline as the number to get you? That is correct. That is correct. <laughs> here, hey, hey, we've got the video. Let me run and grab one here. <laughs> All right, so this is not good for radio, but, you know, good for the uh, podcast. So here I am. This is the book. It was actually a contest, but we don't worry about that. (laughs) And first page, title page, copyright page, and, yep, that phone number right there (laughs) is still my parents' home phone number. (laughs) Actually, even better, it's it's their address. I was living at home then. And yes, people have called. So, so Pan, Pan Mac called there. Yes, so, someone got a That's hold right. of that. Pan McMillan. Someone got a hold of Contest and and said, "All right, we've got to find this independent publisher. How come we've never heard of them before?" I think Kate Patterson, who she was the commissioning editor at McMillan, she's now the director of publishing. She has risen in twenty two years to be the big cheese, and she's still my publisher to this day. I think she probably suspected it was self-published. Yeah. But, you know, as you can see from that, I, I made it look pretty schmick. Yeah. And yeah. the goal was to make it look like 
a real action thriller book and and that was the plan i wasn't going to make my fortune self-publishing i just did it to get noticed luckily i got noticed <laughs> so how I, I should mention to the self-publishers out there only one publisher ever called me nobody else <laughs> ever called so what inspired you to actually start writing because i know that there's a part in stephen king's auto biography slash the memoir on his own craft where he said for him what spurred him on to write you know his first book was the fact that he was reading stuff that he thought was you know that that he could do better than that yeah was, I, I've read was that, that kind of the same uh for you similar but different i was looking at the stuff i was reading and i thought they're not doing something that i would like and i wanted more action and i wanted more pace yeah and i didn't want any rest breaks and it's funny, so I feel my progression. I learned a lot with Contest. I think Ice Station was a real quantum leap up. Temple and Area 7 followed on at that, sp that pace. But then I did this book called Scarecrow. And yeah. Scarecrow, it had the hero of Ice Station and Area 7 in it. And Scarecrow, I set myself this goal of writing this mega-sized action scene at the start. And it was this scene in Siberia and there's a typhoon submarine and a dry dock and there's a building that explodes and the helicopters and flying jets and i said everything after that scene has to get bigger mm -hmm. and scarecrow to this day was this giant quantum leap up in my books so yeah i'm sort of like i i know that stephen king i read that book he did on writing and yeah. i looked at what i was reading and thought they're not doing something which i'd like to read and Turned out a lot of people sort of are like me and like that too. Do I'm you, also going, I go to the movies a lot. I go yeah. to see the Marvel movies on the first weekend they're out. Yeah, right. You know, I've seen all the Star Wars movies, but I was out watching, you know, the Avengers, you know, Infinity War and Endgame on the opening weekend in cinemas where people were cheering at the screen. And I love that stuff. That's, that's sort of what I was trying to do in the books. The closest <laughs> thing I've seen on screen to your books, though, you almost, you almost out action film the action films and the closest thing i think that they, they may have even been inspired by your books but the closest thing i've seen to that is probably fury road just that yeah you know no one even yeah. no one takes a piss from start to finish it's just we're in a <laughs> car and we're driving yeah uh and you I, know, I i i agree i was watching fury road going that's the kind of movie i'd make yeah and the, and the new star wars are a bit the same too like the the, the most recent star wars they're they're all a bit the same but tell me do you ever feel in in writing these books particularly early day when you were a young man writing you know you were you were still at uni writing ice station did you yeah. ever you know take a break put the pen down and feel the same way that someone reading it would because we all remember kind of having you know a heart rate and uh, yeah almost a little bit of uh, you know a little yeah. bit out of breath reading your books did you ever feel that writing it yes <laughs> <laughs> all all the time even <laughs> Even this morning, I was writing my new book this morning, the one something something, the last book in the Jack West series, and I, I just got exhausted. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm literally doing this. Today was part of. It'll take me about two weeks to write it. This is one of the biggest action scenes I've ever done, possibly the biggest. And, yeah, I'm just exhausted at the end of it. I just have to go and sort of sit down, you know, sit down on the couch, grab a beer, click on the TV, <laughs> just stop. Yeah, yeah. Tune out for I a bit. I figure I'm a big believer right from the start that the energy I put onto the page is what leaps off the page to you when you read it. And if it's making you just go, oh, my God, I need a break, then that's exactly what I'm after. I love hearing that. <laughs> so how long did the first book take to write? It was That wasn't two weeks, was it? <laughs> no, no. Oh, so it's, it's a good question. Contest took 12 months to the day yep. to write the first draft. And then, you know, months and months of revision. Nowadays, since I've been doing it for a while now, I can do a first draft in about seven months. Yeah. And then I still revise it for another five or six months. Okay. So, and the revisions make it faster and faster. So, still takes a, a little over a year to yeah. do them, which is why I can't quite do one book a year. Yeah. With your uh, early days of your writing, obviously you're writing about, you know, different countries and different uh, par paramilitaries and you know guerrilla armies and stuff like that. Had you travelled that much at that point in your life? You know, 19 years old, 
writing about, oh, you know, like, fuck it. The South Africans are the bad guys in this one. Like, you know? <laughs> yeah. So my, my experience with South Africa at that point was uh, Lethal Weapon 2. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know the diplomatic one. Diplomatic immunity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so so no uh yeah. when i when i wrote the first i mean the first bunch of books contest ice station temple you know new york city antarctica peru i hadn't been to any of those i i was using lonely planets to uh you know figure out distances yeah, yeah. the first one i actually the first one i got to research and go to the country was area seven i actually went to lake powell in utah and got on a boat and went around this this artificial lake in the desert. Uh, and I've been fortunate since then, especially when you get into Seven Wonders and those books, I've been to the pyramids and Stonehenge and Easter Island. And about 18 months ago, living here in LA, I went to Mexico to Chichen Itza. Yeah. Um, and these places are just, I tell anybody who wants to write a book, you don't have to visit a place to write about it. You can just go and research it, especially with the internet today. Mm. But you always get those little extra bits when you go. Um, but yeah, no, back then, not a chance. I was, <laughs> I, I researched, I researched Ice Station entirely in uh, Chatswood Library in uh, the North Shore of Sydney, um, and and I, I've done speeches there since. And it's so nice to tell the audience. I say I researched this international best-selling book in this local public library, and they literally look around and go. Man, that's awesome. And it hasn't changed much either, I imagine, <laughs> Chatswood Library, no. Did you get to the end of your university course? I mean, that seems like quite a heavy extra workload on top. I did. I did. Yeah. I, got my, I got my law degree, um, which I'm very, very glad I did. I think it's just good to have finished it. Yeah. But I've never practiced as so a lawyer. you never admitted to the Supreme Court of New South Wales? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> although I, um, I do... I do read the contracts that I signed with movie studios. Yeah. I sold one of my books to Disney and the contract they got me to sign, <laughs> it said all the things I couldn't do. I couldn't do keychains, calendars, fluffy toys. And they went through it item by item, all the things I, I could not do that I was selling to them. And on all of the movie deals, I had to guarantee, guarantee that the book was my original work throughout the universe. Right. Right. So there is a. I am stealing all my ideas from a guy on Mars, but <laughs> until he gets here, that, that's legit. That yeah. is in the contract. That's, that's in so the contract. Would so you the, ever the make. The lawyer in me gets me to do that. Yeah, right. So would you ever make any Jack West Jr. keychains <laughs> if, if you had the means? You know, I think, uh, especially having watched the South Park special the other day, uh, I think. Um, It'd be kind of fun to cheekily make some keychains uh, yeah. and anything I ever sold to Disney. They ended up not making that one. That was Hover Car Racer. Um, so the rights are back with me. So we might get some keychains done. Might get some keychains there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, uh, remember the keychains. Keychains and calendars. <laughs> That's what. Happy when, meals, I suppose. When did the penny drop for you? I, I remember reading uh, Ice Station and, and Contest and then Scarecrow, and eventually we'd all hear about this local writer, this Australian writer. You know, the first thing they say, which I guess kind of is, is the best way of uh, explaining how big a book's gone is how many languages it's been published around the world. Yeah. That's always a big yeah. one. I remember hearing that, and that's when the penny dropped it, how big, how big the Matthew Riley books were. How, when did you first mm -hmm. figure out you'd sent something around the moon? You know, Ice Station was quickly sold. Macmillan in Australia snapped it up and it was quickly sold to the US and the UK. And uh, without getting into the weeds, Australia is a unique market because we speak and read English. Yep. Uh, most territories are done in their native language, but the US and the UK are the two biggest and Australia is English as well. Yep. There was a Frankfurt book fair around that time and there was a German publisher who offered me, it was like, I forget the number, it was like 300,000 euros for Ice Station and Temple. And I'd, I'd, I hadn't even finished Temple at that time. I was, it was like three quarters finished. And that was for German rights. Right. And that was when you that was when the Aussie against the Euro was like 
double points. Yeah. <laughs> and off the top of my head, that was the moment where I was like, oh, my God, I'm, I'm getting big money for a German edition yeah, yeah, you know, right. of, so of, of Ice Station and Temple. And, and I think that sort of really set it off because the languages then went like dominoes. We yeah. did Dutch, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, Thai, Japanese. The Japanese did a graphic novel of Ice Station. <laughs> uh, it's the only graphic novel really? in existence. Oh, and it's oh, all awesome. I how much they're going for. <laughs> yeah. Need to get a copy of that. Yeah. Actually, I should, I should put up some of the pictures. I, I would show the pictures from the Japanese graphic novel at speeches I would do. Yeah, right. And I'd put them up on a big screen because nobody <laughs> can get them. I, they sent me some, you know, author copies and it's amazing. It, it's got... You might remember there's a scene where Mother, the Marine, uh, gets her leg bitten by a killer whale and the killer yeah. whale actually rips it off. That is drawn in all its gory detail in the Japanese graphic novel of Ice Station. <laughs> oh, that's great. And, and then where do you find your hotspots now? Obviously, you've sold to all these different um, you know, languages. You know, we always ask this question to musicians. Silverchair had a massive following in Brazil. And, and I imagine, right. yeah, yeah, I imagine Ice Station and and, and your books have uh, have got some sort of pocket somewhere where they're real fans. Yeah, two spring to mind, and it's kind of funny. Early in Holland, the yeah. Dutch editions were big sellers for <laughs> for me, and recently, God love them, uh, there is a publisher in Bulgaria who is <laughs> a huge fan, and. They jumped onto Ice Station years ago, and every couple of years, we get this email from this publisher in Bulgaria and says, listen, we're not a big market, but we love Matthew Riley's books. Can we get the rights? And they pay me like 500 bucks for <laughs> the publishing rights in Bulgarian. Uh, and I can honestly say I am legitimately big in Bulgaria. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever been there? No, I should. <laughs> don't tell. Don't tell. No. Don't tell the... The people in Bulgaria. This could no, be a scandal. Like, 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 no, I haven't. No, I should Imagine a book tour through all the big cities in Bulgaria. It, I, I think it would actually be surprisingly popular. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I, I've done book tours in strange places. I, I've done signings in like London and in the public library in New York City. I did one in Singapore in the middle of the night, Changi Airport, when all the people <laughs> really? were going through. It was mid, a midnight book signing. <laughs> And in the good terminal or the dodgy one? <laughs> it w well, it was the good one. It yeah, seemed yeah. good. But yeah, people walking by. Honestly, I kid you not. Jeez, I haven't thought about this in years. There's you're at, you know, you get an early crowd. People line up and they get their book signed, and then the crowd disappears, and you get people wandering by, and they see you sitting at this table with all these posters around it. And this dude sort of walks by. This is again 1 a.m. Changi Airport, Singapore. This dude's walking by and he sees me and he stops and he turns and he looks at me and I'm sitting all these posters with my name on it around me. He walks over to me and he leans in close and he goes, can you tell me where the restroom is? <laughs> <laughs> the big who are you? <laughs> but I, I, I said to my publicist, I think the signing is now done. We're, we're finished here. <laughs> So, uh, are there people from you know all all different walks alive coming to your book signings? Like, you, like from yeah. the ones that yeah. I've that I've been to, there are quite a cross section of humanity yeah. that are lining up at your table. Uh, yeah, I would say it's very broad. You know, if you had an, an event where there were you know three hundred people, I would say ninety percent are adults, pretty fifty fifty men and women. Some might say the books seem more blokey, but mm. a lot of female readers. And really only a small percentage would be teenagers. Yep. You get a few young kids, and that's a strange sort of phenomenon at what age kids jump into my books. And it's, it's, it's interesting that they are for adults, and it, it's adults who largely read them. But, yeah, men, women, blue collar, white collar. Yeah. Uh, I think it's just people who like escapism. It's interesting you said that about teenage boys because – Teenage boys are definitely the target market for the movies. Young men, particularly with the diehards and the and the you know mm. lethal weapons. So uh, yeah, it must be something about the the medium. Reading in itself is uh, is is for everyone, as opposed to sitting down for two hours watching Bruce Willis. Yeah. 
It's a, it's a strange phenomenon, and I could go on for hours, but it seems boys read until about the age of 12, mm-hmm. and then they go off and play football and cricket, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. girls keep reading, and you have to sort of get boys back yeah. at about age 19 or 20. And yeah. if there's one thing that I see a lot, and I get told a lot at the book signings, it's a 26-year-old guy who says, my mother or my father gave me one of your books, and now I'm back into reading. Yeah. I hadn't read a book since high school. I hear that a lot. When, when you visit, say, for a book signing in a country that you have either stigmatized or used as part of your story, <laughs> what, what are the thoughts when you go, you know, when, when it's a, an away game for you and you arrive in their country and you've previously written them up as, you know, ethno-fascists? Yeah, you know, <laughs> I... I I've done successful book tours in South Africa. Fine, no problems. Uh, Great Britain, fine, no problems. There have been some dastardly British villains. Two, but there remains one, and it continues, and it's continued for a long time. The French. Yeah. yeah. The French. There were French villains in Ice Station, which came out in 1998. And then again in Scarecrow, where I blew yeah. up one of their aircraft carriers. carriers yeah. <laughs> To this day, I am not published in the French language. <laughs> I, am pu- I am published in every language around France. Really? Spanish, Italian, Dutch, German, obviously English. But uh, so, so no, I've, I've never had any, nobody's ever complained to me about being a villain in, in any of the books, but... The French, by not publishing me, made, it's made a cold me war. It's a cold war. And so, <laughs> so actually, it was so funny because all those early things we discussed before, you know, that I'd seen this big deal in Germany, I sold all these rights to other languages, but the French consistently said no. <laughs> and so after Ice Station and after Scarecrow, I, I did write a kid's book, Hover Car Racer, and I just made a gratuitously French villain for that one because I figured stuff them I was yeah. never going to be published there anyway let's, let's double down here <laughs> yeah. now tell us about the, the, the most recent book yeah Two Lost Mountains oh, Two Lost Mountains it's um, so I mean you hear behind me you can see Seven Ancient Wonders mm-hmm. um, you know a few years ago I decided to really jump into an Indiana Jones style series and I created this sort of wonderful sort of archaeologist soldier hero in Jack West Jr. And he came out in Seven Ancient Wonders and I thought, I'll write a sequel. And I thought, how do I make people know it's a sequel? I'll call it The Six Sacred Stones. And, well, you know, it looks like we're counting down. And yeah. <laughs> once you do that, you realise that all readers have, a lot of readers have completion issues. Yeah. And they were like, great, Matthew Riley's going to count down seven six five four three two one And that's now what I've done. So we've had Seven Ancient Wonders, Six Sacred Stones, Five Greatest Warriors, Four Legendary Kingdoms, Three Secret Cities, and this one is now The Two Lost Mountains. And how to describe it, the, the stakes in a Matthew Riley book have just got bigger and bigger and bigger over the years. And, you know, at one point you're saving, you know, a country. Then you're saving in Temple, you're saving the world. And with Jack West, basically the universe is about to collapse in a single in a singularity. And so as we're in the two lost mountains, he has to find these these two historic mountains are part of a group called the Five Iron Mountains. And unless he does a certain thing by a certain date, the universe is going to come in a big crunch and everybody's going to die. So the stakes are pretty high as this one begins. It begins very hot off the tail of the last book. It's really when we get to the end of the one that you're writing now, I'm I'm really expecting that to almost explode in my hands when we get to the end of it. Yeah, so, I mean, what, what you're being very nice to say, Earl, is uh, once I wrote The Four Legendary Kingdoms and jumped into 3, 2, and 1, 3, 2, and 1 are really just one story. Yeah. And Three Secret Cities sort of kicked off this race to what we call the Omega event, the collapse of the universe. And Two Lost Mountains is like the middle, it's the darker one. It's the one where things are looking pretty bad. And it all builds to the final book, the one something something, um, which as you have successfully anticipated, 
the one something something is literally the whole 400 page book is a climax yeah so the whole thing is a so it yeah well it's a long way of saying when i started the four legendary kingdoms kicked off the second half of this series and three two one is essentially one story and you're, you're right there you try not to leave people with cliffhanger you try to leave yeah. them with a bit of an upbeat moment so they're ready to jump into the last one well, every time I read one of your books, and I know that you um, you'd really like to see one of these made into a movie, and then you get about four or five pages in, and then you're just like, "Well, that sounds expensive." <laughs> um, <laughs> would you ever compromise on y your action to get something turned into a movie? If a person came to you and said, "Love the story, just pick two of these big." action yeah. scenes and maybe we can do them on the computer yeah no then they're yeah. not the right person yeah um you know and the special effects have become so good i had an effects guy tell me he could do the entire hovercraft chase in ice station <laughs> in a computer yeah and you wouldn't even know yeah. especially when you've got hard surfaces dinosaurs and creatures and you know the bear that attacked leonardo dicaprio and the revenant that's hard to do but spaceships and vehicles are actually pretty easy to do yeah yeah and i mean when it comes to film rights it goes back to what we were saying before and what you just said i write the books to be big giant action movies mm -hmm. and that means they're going to be a hundred million dollars i yeah. i came close with the great zoo of china and sony uh they got a great screenplay done and it was going to be expensive it was going to be 120 million dollar yeah. just at Blockbuster and they and the screenwriter had kept all of my wild dragon action scenes, you know, dragons against fighter jets and throwing pieces of freeway at buildings. And they hired a director and then they parted ways with him. And once they parted ways with the director, the the movie project founded. So that's the way the business works. Yeah. I'm I'm now increasingly getting offers for T V shows and yeah. saying they messed up the last season, but thank God for Game of Thrones because yeah. Game yeah. of Thrones, it's based something like Seven Wonders going down to Two Lost Mountains. Seven Wonders is season one, Six Stones is season two. Yeah. One book per season. Thank you, Game of Thrones. So yeah. I increasingly get in, I get inquiries for TV shows more so than movies these Game days. Game of Thrones, yeah, changed the way everyone views stories, I guess you could say. Sure did. Yeah. yeah. I'm interested yeah. to know, though, in the midst of all this, we got a um, a short story, the yeah. Chinese Splashdown. How did that come about? Like, was that because you just got a bit stuck with, you know, the big story and just wanted a side path, you know, just to, to keep your, your craft sharp? Or was, or is this just, you know, a great idea you had? Sometimes when I'm on a book tour, um, you know, you, you're going from you know, book signings to television studios and back to your hotel. And you're often sort of amped up. And I, I had the idea for Jack West Jr. and the Chinese Splashdown on the last book tour. And I knew with Two Lost Mountains, without spoiling for people, but yeah, Jack is going to have to do something about an object on the surface of the moon. And I just wanted to have this totally impossible task that he has to complete. And there is this thing, this this sort of alien altar on the moon. And and so with the Chinese Splashdown short story, I thought, well, I'm going to do this in the Two Lost Mountains anyway. And it gets prefaced in Three Secret Cities. And so I thought, well, why don't I just have this little side st short story adventure? I always assume it's the big fans who are going to read the short stories. The, the general mass readership probably won't. So it always has to exist as a little side departure so that anybody, so it can't be mandatory for everybody to read it, but you'll get a little extra from that. And yeah. it gets, as you've, you've read Two Lost Mountains, the splashdown does get a mention in it. Yeah. But I have to really tread a fine line that if someone hasn't read Chinese splashdown, it doesn't affect Two Lost Mountains. And it's a story that has to go in a circle and come back to where it began in that way, but... It was still a pretty fun story, and it had the aero sub in it. Which, if you don't know what an aero yeah. sub is, look it up. It's phenomenal. <laughs> They're real. <laughs> Just one last question here for you, Matthew. Um, oh. We um, obviously 
big fans of your riding, so we spent the whole time talking about your, your craft. But I do want to know what you're driving over there in LA. I am driving a uh, Mercedes Benz. Uh, C63 AMG, okay. uh, which if you're a yeah. if you're a car fan, it's the car that Jeremy Clarkson on Top Gear said that some mad German decided to put a six liter V8 into a mid sized car. <laughs> 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 it's uh, you like your cars, boys? Yeah, like yeah, cars? yeah. What I are would, you uh, driving? Me? Uh, <laughs> uh, well. Um, Obviously, you know, it's, it's a bit different when you're in charge of a regional newspaper. You know, you have to kind of live within your means. So I'm in a, uh, I'm in a 2010 VE Commodore with uh, stretch timing chains and uh, two blown <laughs> O2 sensors at the moment. And I thought the SS Ute might be a, uh, yeah. might be your car. Well, until you know the, the ATO classifies that as a farm implement, then maybe you know I can't can't really justify that much of an asset write-off at this stage. But um, where, where is your where is your tax, tax planning? Where's your uh, your Back to the Future car? Is it still in in, in Australia? The uh, Delorean Clancy, yeah. yeah. It yeah no I um under a tarp somewhere you know I, yeah well it's my my buddy in canberra is tooling around canberra in my delorean um <laughs> i've seen it ble- yeah. bless yeah. him just to just to, just to keep it running you know keep the engine running i had the d in australia for what 10 years so i had it yeah. converted to right hand drive right um and it took so long i'll be damned if i was going to convert it back to left hand drive when i moved over yeah. here so <laughs> I'm happy. My, my buddy keeps it running. We actually spoke to a car modification company who may want to put an electric engine in it, um, which I think is a great idea because yeah. beautiful car, but it's not the fastest car in the no. world. Uh, um, no, and oh, just, yeah, um, and just one last question for our readers. What have you got in the bag in the back of the Benz? You know, what, 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 what are you gaming with now? In terms of your golf, oh, oh dear! This is an admission. I I have the PXGs. Right. Uh, yeah. The, okay. The, the Parsons. They the Parsons are, clubs. Yeah, they really are the uh, they, DeLorean of golf clubs, aren't they? They they are, I, that's a really good way of putting it. They are the DeLorean of golf clubs, and I must say, I got them in 2016, and I haven't felt like buying new irons ever since then yeah, that's uh, good. they are the they're the best irons i've ever hit yeah you know me well you know me well and what's i your... write and i golf i <laughs> yeah, write yeah, and i golf yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh what are you playing off yeah that was my next question uh, over there <laughs> <laughs> uh my handicap is uh 3.7 right now that's so. p- pretty tidy what's the uh slope rating of the, 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 the club that you're playing at over there is it uh I is, think it's about is it a tough 133. Course? Jesus yeah, Christ. Yeah. It's, um, <laughs> it's a bit hard. You know, I, I get in, you know, whenever I get this question, especially in front of a live audience, I get in trouble because somebody usually in the front row says, stop playing golf and finish the last Jack West book. <laughs> <laughs> and I try, I try to tell them that the golf is good for mental health, you know. I yeah. literally sit in a room by myself for long, long hours at a time. Yeah. So yeah. it's 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 good for me to get out in the sun and socialise with human beings. Well, fast cars, uh, long hours playing golf, and action books. It's I think uh, everyone would aspire yeah. to a life like that in Los Angeles. I reckon you'd be really good to play golf with if you're playing that fast too, <laughs> real fast. <laughs> There's, there's nothing games, worse. There's, there's, right. there's, there's nothing worse than slow golf. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. Thanks for joining us today, Matthew. Uh, we look forward to the new book, and uh, we look forward to it's a good one in the near future. Seeing uh, Los Angeles bring these these books to life on the screen. Guys, thank you so much for having me. No Love worries. your work. Thanks, Thanks man. Bye.